Okay, so right off the bat, I can see that the font that I picked was not compatible, so um, bear with me if some of the slides look funny. But, um, all right, so I'll start. I guess my talk is going to center around wetlands, and specifically wetlands in, in Superior. Um, so for those of you from Minnesota, you'll learn a lot about wetlands in Superior. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then I'll talk a little bit about efforts within our city to deal with all the wetlands that we have in our city. So for some background, um, you can kind of think of Superior like a little mini New Orleans. We're, um, we're sandwiched between a huge water body and the mouth of a really big river. And if you look at Duluth and Superior, of course, huge differences. Duluth is pretty steep and rocky, and Superior is very flat. We're pretty much the ones that take all the brunt of the water <laughs> when we have flooding. Um, although it, we look at last June, and it's a different story. But, um, so what this map shows is a picture of wetlands in the city of Superior. 86% of the land in the city that is not developed is wetlands. So that kind of gives you some perspective on the constraints in, of, on development in the city. Um, and then for some more perspective on that, the state of Wisconsin has actually lost half of the wetlands that we used to have. So there used to be even more wetlands in the city of Superior than what you see here. Um, Nevertheless, we still need to live in the city, work here, play here. We um, hope to keep growing here. So there's, there's always going to be pressure between development and, and preservation of wetlands and then handling the functions that those wetlands provide for us. And so that's some of the stuff I'm going to talk about. So what is a wetland? I'm sure many of you are pretty familiar with this, but I'm going to talk a little bit about um, wetland functions, but first I want to make sure we all understand what a wetland is. And uh, there's the classic image of a wetland as water with ducks and cattails. <laughs> um, and that gets a lot of people in trouble because wetlands can often be dry. Wetlands, some wetlands have cracked dry soil by the end of the summertime and they're still a wetland. Some are forested, some are shrubs, some are wide open grasslands. Um, they have a lot of different appearances. So it's important to understand um, what wetlands look like and what, what it means when somebody says a wetland. And if you ever have any questions about that, you can always talk to um, me or folks at the county, the DNR, some of the federal agencies, and they'll help you understand that. So I'll just go through some pictures here. This is um, like a shrub wetland, an older shrub wetland, and we have a, a wooded sedge meadow, um, a forest of wetland, just to give you some ideas of the different appearances that wetlands can have. So now I'll go through some of the, the functions that wetlands provide for us. Um, I get excited about this. I love, I love wetlands. So, um, so here's a couple of different plants that all live in wetlands. There's plants in wetlands are really cool. Plants have all kinds of neat adaptations for living in wetlands, um, and they're really fascinating. And you could easily overlook them if you didn't know what you were looking for. For example, some plants have really squishy stems. If you squish them, they're like sponges inside. And that's because they have all this extra space to hold air in their stems and their roots because they're basically drowned, so they have to hold all this extra air. And that's something unique to wetland plants. Another thing you'll find on some wetland plants is really waxy outsides to their leaves, and that's to keep the water out and keep the air in. Um, if you look at trees in forests and wetlands, sometimes the base of the trees will have these big, broad bases of the stems. And that's, again, they're trying to fit more air inside the trees and inside the, the um, circulatory system, basically, for the tree. And so they end up with these big broad stems when they get close to being underneath the water and ground. Um, so wetlands provide really important habitat for certain plants. So there's a lot of plants that you will only find in wetlands. In fact, a lot of the plants that we have in the state that are rare plants are only found in wetlands. And in fact, there's some right here in Superior that are rare plants in the state, but they're kind of common here because we have so many wetlands in our area. And of course, the plants that we find in wetlands are really important for the critters that we find in wetlands. Uh, for example, there's a mole grass up here, this one on the top right, it has these nutty little seeds and we have a lot of sedges and other rushes that, that grow in wetlands. And those seeds are really nutritious and hardy for um, waterfowl, for example, the critters that live in wetlands. <clears throat> so moving right on to those critters, um, let's see, I have all these neat facts about animals that I just found out today when I was preparing for this talk. Half of all the birds in Wisconsin use wetlands to either feed or nest. Half of all the bird species that we see. 90% of all the recreational fish species depend on wetlands for some part of their life. Um, so 
Critters also use them for breeding, they use wetlands for feeding, for hunting for, for other animals that are living there. They hibernate in wetlands, um, they rest in wetlands while they're migrating. So they're very important refuges for animals and very important habitat. And there's some, as I said, there's many species that hone in on wetlands specifically and can only survive if there are wetlands. Um, so really important to protect the ones that we have. These are some examples of animals that you'll see in wetlands. This guy's really cool. This is an American bittern, if you don't know what that is. And his strategy for camouflage is these little stripes on his neck. If he feels threatened, he throws his beak up in the air and sways like the grass. Sways <laughs> <laughs> like the grass. Um, let's see, a wood turtle, so they're dependent on both forest and wetlands. Wood ducks, how's it build those? Leopard frog. All kinds of really cool critters that you only find in wetlands. This one is really poignant and um, was a really good teachable moment for us last June after the floods. Wetlands are critical for flood and for water attenuation. Um, this is a picture here you might recognize. Well, this is um, Parker Lightly, the buildings out there, and Marina Drive washed out. You might recognize some of these pictures from the flood. Um, so you probably know this, but when when we lose natural land cover, we lose the ability to hold stormwater on the landscape. Um, when rain or snow is melting and hits pavement, hits clay soils like we have, hits lawns even, um, it runs off faster than if it's hitting, say, a wetland or a forest um, or a shrubland. So if we can maintain those wetlands in the landscape, we can slow the water down and minimize some of the damage that we see from flooding. Wetlands act like sponges on the landscape. There's a couple of metaphors I'm going to use here. I think they're helpful for just remembering the, the values of wetlands and talking to other people about the values of wetlands. They act like sponges, especially here on clay soils. Our clay soils are basically like concrete. <laughs> um, but whereas wetlands have all this organic material in the soil, they're very rich soils in these wetlands, and that's partly because they're saturated, and so all that organic in there just can't decompose the way it does on upland soils. That's why you find mummies sometimes in old ancient wetlands. <laughs> Things just don't decompose there like they usually do. It's all that organic material that's trapped in the soil and it works like a great sponge. And so we, we have managed to hold a lot more stormwater when we have more wetlands. Really important, like I said, when we're down in this low, flat clay soils with water all around us. They also act as storage for water. So the sponges soak it up and then they hold that water. And so in times of drought, we have these sponges that are slowly releasing water into the streams, into our groundwater, recharging all those, making sure that there's still a little bit of flow for the fish, for the insects, making sure there's still some water in our groundwater for those of us that depend on that for drinking water. Um, so they act like sponges and like water storage for us. When we fill wetlands, we lose all those functions. Um, they also help with water quality, so they act like filters too. Just like if you were to run water through a sponge, it would take out a lot of the chunks. <laughs> the kind of the same thing happens when you run floodwaters through a wetland. The grasses and cattails and shrubs and trees physically remove the sediment, the sediment particles, but they also pull out nutrients that are in the water, things we can't see. Some of the pollutants um, get pulled up, taken up by the plants, the nutrients actually get used by the plants. Some of the, um, the chemical compounds get, get neutralized, basically, when they're in those wetlands. Um, so very important filters for us. And they also act like buffers. And here again, we can kind of think of New Orleans. When they had Katrina come through, they quickly realized the value of all those wetlands that they had lost <laughs> on the ocean front. Um, they're really great buffers for shorelines along streams and also along the lake, um, big lakes, Lake Superior, and small lakes help prevent erosion from big waves, from fast moving water. So they're, they're um, great buffers for us too and really important to maintain the ones that we have. And lastly is um, all the fun stuff that we get to do in wetlands. People hunt wetlands, hunt in wetlands, waterfowl, deer hunting. Um, like I said, fishing, 90% of all the fish species that we go after depend on wetlands for some part of their life cycle. Uh, let's see, we have cultural resources on our wetlands. 
Um, wild rice, of course, is dependent on wetlands. We grow a lot of cranberries, especially in the state, again, dependent on wetlands. And they're just great places to play and learn and see amazing critters and new plants, meet new plants. Um, so pretty special places. All right, so I'm gonna go through some things that we're doing in the city of Superior and um, give you more info on that. So the first one that I'm gonna talk about is the bulk of my job in, um, I'm gonna spend quite a bit of time talking about it. It's called a Special Area Management Plan. It's kind of unique to Superior. There's actually only a few communities in the country that have a Special Area Management Plan, which is the SAMP, is what we call it. So I'm gonna keep saying SAMP. It's a lot shorter, um, but that's what I'm referring to. There's only a few SAMPs in the country, and that's because um, it's really tailored towards communities that are just rich with wetlands. Some people like me think it's a, a huge asset, other people think it's a huge hindrance. And it, it's kind of both. So a SAMP is a way to try to deal with that in a balanced way. What we did with the SAMP um, was basically to look at the whole city and take a big inventory of all the wetlands that we have. <coughs> and then we kind of rate them. We say, well, which wetlands are really high quality and need to be protected for all those functions I just talked about? Which ones are maybe lower quality? And that's a way to steer development in a smart way so that we, when somebody comes to us and says, I want to put in a housing development or I want to start my business here, we can steer them away from those high quality wetlands, hopefully steer them away from wetlands, period. But in a, in a city where 86% of your undeveloped land has wetlands on it, people are really bumping into them all the time, no matter even if they don't want to or try to avoid them. So that's, that's one thing about a SAM, is taking stock of the wetlands that you have and and making sure you're protecting the ones that need protection. Before the SAMP, when somebody would come to the city and say, I want to I want to start a business here, I want to build a store, this is the spot that I like. We had no way of knowing if this was the only wetland of its kind in the city, or if this was one of the most important wetlands for some other reason that we were missing. And now that we've taken this big inventory and surveyed over 5,000 acres of wetlands in the city, we're pretty confident when we make those decisions that we're doing it right. Um, Let's see, another thing about the SAMP is you have somebody like me at the city who can help residents when they have to deal with wetland permitting. Um, usually in the state it's kind of a unique thing if you have to deal with the wetlands. You have all kinds of permitting that you have to deal with when you do development, but wetlands aren't usually one of them. In Superior, it's almost always one of them. And so you have people who just want to put on a, a garage addition, and now they're getting thrown into the wetland permitting process and they don't know if they're going to need compliance or not, it's kind of a tricky thing. And so um, the city has a, a staff person, me, just to help people with that issue. We also set up our own permitting process. And again, because we worked with the agencies on doing this big comprehensive inventory, and we worked with the agencies on deciding which wetlands would be targeted for development and which ones would be protected. We've kind of gone through them with this criteria and, and earned their trust and settled on a permitting process. That enables us to do an expedited permitting process. And it's not that people are shortcutting the permitting process, it's just that we've already kind of gone through all the criteria in advance and picked out which wetlands are low quality wetlands and probably okay to have them be filled. Um, we've done all that in advance. So people get a wetlands faster, or permits faster, they get them cheaper and they get them um, much more likely to be in compliance because they're working with somebody who knows what they're doing. And the other thing is, uh, part of the reason that we're allowed to do this expedited permit process is because the city has taken on the responsibility of doing mitigation. And for those of you that don't know what that means, when you fill a wetland, you have to create a wetland somewhere else. And ideally, the state will always push you to not fill a wetland or to minimize how much you have to fill if you have to fill a wetland. And then, if you really do need to fill a wetland, you need to do mitigation. So they try to avoid all that. It's, it's kind of a last resort. But when you do need to fill a wetland, like when you're doing development in Superior, you need to mitigate for that. If you fill an acre of a wetland, you have to fill a little bit, you create a little bit more than an acre to try to offset that. Well, the city has gone and created over 100 acres of wetlands just outside of Superior and South Superior. And we did that in anticipation of future development. So the idea is that We've invested in this site. We're going to give it time and give it the, the resources that it needs to turn it into a nice wetland 
so that when somebody comes to us and wants to build a store or a home, we've already got a really nice wetland to offset the loss that we're going to incur. Rather than trying to do it in a quick hurry and do it on the cheap when this person really wants their permit. <laughs> um, so again, it's just part of the, the strategic and right way of dealing with, with wetland fills that are going to happen when you're in a city like Superior. Is the city interested in purchasing future uh, mitigation credits? Credits, rather. We are generating our own at our own mitigation bank that I talked about mm -hmm. that we built, um, and we're looking at building another one. So we're kind of set for credits. They're kind of set, okay. Yeah. All right. So this, that's the SAMP program, and I'm happy to answer more questions about that. Um, I'll have my contact info on the top there. It's kind of a complicated thing to explain in three minutes, but. Um, but that's the gist of it. This is our wetland mitigation bank. This is, excuse me, this is County Highway Z, and then Lyman Lake Road, if you know where that is. It's South Superior. Um, it's about a 120 acre site. It's got Bear Creek running right through it. It's a pretty neat little site. It used to be a farm field. Um, most of the site is about 15, 20 feet above the creek, kind of a flat plateau. It was paved and ditched and then drained into the creek. The city went in and um, put in a series of berms that kind of hold back water and, and lots of different different habitat areas. And now it's, let's see, it looks more like this. It's a series of sedge meadows, um, deep marsh, shallow marsh, shrubland, and we're working on restoring forests. I just put um, about 35,000 tree seedlings there <laughs> this spring, or had a contractor do it, I didn't do it. Um, <laughs> But so we're trying to restore a really wide range of wet, wetland habitat out there. And again, that's to offset impacts that we're expecting to happen in the city. But we're trying to get this going and make sure that it actually turns into a nice wetland so we know when we lose the wetlands in the city, we're actually regaining them somewhere else. Um, and we do that before we lose the, the wetlands in the city. Could I ask two very quick questions that you'll sure. be able to answer right away? Do you have the National Wetland Inventory maps at your, sh your shop? Yeah. Okay, and then the second question is, what is the threshold for individual permit under Section 4 for being one that? I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay, it's okay. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, so we have some land within the city that's been set aside through preservation easements. Um, but they're done a little bit differently than the easements like Jane was talking about. These ones are tied to projects that have happened in the city that have, um, that have impacted wetlands. And so rather than doing mitigation where we fill the wetland and build one somewhere else, we fill the wetland and then protect the wetland somewhere else. So when you do that, you have to actually protect way more wetland than you fill. <laughs> um, and they do that because you're not, it's a net loss of the wetlands essentially. You know, you're protecting some, but you're not creating any more even though you, you filled some. Mm -hmm. So this, um, this is our landfill. This is Highway 53 and 2 coming into town. Um, if you're going out to Wisconsin Point, you go this way and go off to the point. All the area around there that you're driving through, not all of it, but the majority of it is wetland. And a lot of that has been protected now because of the projects that have been done in the city where we had to preserve wetlands to offset the wetlands impacts that were incurred. Do you know, is it ratio to the one or is it more than that? It's now? 8 to 1. 8 to 1? Yeah. Okay. At least for us in the city. So I guess the message I really want to get across is just to, if you have wetlands, to let them grow if you can. If you can't, come and talk to me and I can help you with the permitting. <laughs> but um, but uh, I get calls from people all the time that want to know if they can mow their wetlands. They don't know if that's against the rules or not. And I really try to convince them that there's so many great functions like I just talked about. They're really lucky to have wetlands there. They get all kinds of unique critters that nobody else gets. They might have less flooding in their basement because they have the wetland. If they try to fill it to flatten it out and get themselves more dry in the yard, they might end up actually creating problems for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so, like the first speaker mentioned, tall plants equal deep roots. So, if you've got a little wet spot on your property where you have wetland plants growing over your waist, um, if you cut those down and try to keep a lawn there, for one thing, you're going to be running your lawnmower through water all the time. When running it up. For another, though, you might actually be decreasing the water storage of your yard and making flooding problems for yourself and your neighbors. I see that all the time in the city. And wetlands are not always as wet as you think. So um, if you aren't sure if you have wetlands, again, try to find someone that can help you. 
you identify them because you you don't want to be bumping into state and federal laws governing weapon protection. Um, so just make sure you check on that first. So yeah. they would need someone that would be able to identify uh, soils and hydrophytic plants. Yeah, but you know it's actually usually simpler than that. Like do you guys do that? I, I can do it, yeah. yeah. People call me in the city and have a question. I'll just run out and look. Yeah. Usually I can tell from glancing at it. If it's tricky, then you get a delineator and it's a little more involved. But usually I can just kind of eyeball it and say where you should avoid. For construction projects, it's a little different. But um, for most things, I can just go talk to people about it. So that's the 20-minute wetland talk. Um, Here's some contact information lines up on the top left, Gary McNamara, that's me. But I also have some information for folks in the city who deal with um, stormwater projects, construction projects, landscaping projects, anything where you might be doing some, some grading, um, where you might be impacting stormwater, you want to be calling some of these people. And then the folks locally that deal with wetlands from the agencies would be the Army Corps and the Wisconsin DNR, Bill Sandy and Steve Valley. Do you have any questions? Where, where is the Corps of Engineers office? Where is that? Yeah. It's in Spooner. Oh, it's in Spooner? Yeah. To come up, if there's something up here, you have to come from Spooner? The Army Corps does, yeah. 